course, would like to acknowledge the Senior Academy um, under Bill Vos's leadership uh, for the opportunity that uh, you've given me this afternoon, uh, as well as the IUPUI administration uh, under the leadership of Charles Bance and the IU Foundation. I uh, especially would like to acknowledge one other person, uh, and that is Charlie Kelly. Uh, Charlie, your uh, humil humility, your perseverance uh, has inspired uh, many of us here in this room on this campus and uh, really around the world, so thank you. Let's, yeah, thank you. Tom. Charlie was one of the founders of the IU Kenya Partnership, and, and I'm really not going to talk too much about the history of IU Kenya Partnership and AMPATH, and that'll have to be in another lecture, so I invite you back another time. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit, so let's turn the clock back a couple of decades. Uh, July 1990, uh, as Craig mentioned, IU's partnership with Moy University uh, had just begun. At that time, there was no AMPATH, no Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, uh, really no Moy University School of Medicine. It wasn't going to open uh, for another three months when it would welcome its inaugural class of students. The fledgling school, destined to become Kenya's second school, uh, consisted at the time of really just about four faculty members. Indiana University collectively became its fifth. Uh, so representing Indiana University, I've recently arrived in Eldoret along with uh, my wife, uh, and uh, my three young sons. So my first task is to find a place to house my family and the contingent of IU visitors, faculty members, resident students who are slated to visit Moore University later in the academic year. Now my Kenyan counterpart uh, at the time was a delightful surgeon by the name of Peter Nurango, and he had introduced me to one of the great Kenyan runners, Ibrahim Hussein. Hussein had invested his winnings uh, in real estate and was renting a number of properties in Eldoret, and so I had gone uh, with him to see one of his houses. We walked in the compound, uh, and to our left was this magnificent two-story uh, building, uh, much larger than what uh, I lived in and live in uh, currently in, in the United States, um, and plenty big enough for my family and for the Indiana University team. But on the right, of the driveway, uh, there was this mud and stick structure that looked like it belongs really in the shanty town from Slumdog, Slumdog Millionaire. Its roof was uh, an irregular, lopsided piece of corrugated sheet metal, and its windows just newspaper plastered across holes in walls. From the door, and it really wasn't a door, it was just a bigger hole in the wall, uh, stepped a young, young man. He seemed uh, tentative, uncomfortable, really caught off guard. His mismatched shirt and his pants uh, were filthy, tattered. Ibrahim uh, Hussein leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, don't worry, he's just a squatter. If you rent the home, I'll kick him out. <laughs> so I scanned the compound. <laughs> Scan the compound, there's a guava tree in the front yard, chirping yellow weavers uh, in its branches. In the backyard, orange and lemon trees, in one side yard, there's an avocado tree, its branches already a groaning from the burden of its green fruit. And in the other side yard, 12-inch goldfish swimming in a man-made pool. I look back at the squatter. His, his name is Bob. For an instant, he catches my gaze, but then he stares at his bare feet. I quickly scan the house and one more time, uh, one more time, and I turn to Mr. Hussein and I say, it's a lovely house. Uh, it's just what IU needs. I'll take it. And then I turned to Bob. Bob, this place could really use a gardener. Would you like a job as a gardener? When the Senior Academy first asked me to reflect on life's lessons and meaning in this lecture, I immediately thought of Ecclesiastes wisdom. There is nothing new under the sun. The important lessons of life have been well articulated by the masters of philosophy, literature, and the arts going back as far as the ancient Greeks. At best, anything I might say in this lecture would be cliche. But when I shared my thoughts with my son, Seth, he pushed back. Dad, life's lessons are common, uh, he said, but your life, like every individual's life, is unique. When you put the cliché in the context of a unique life experience, you elevate the cliché to the original. You give the cliché meaning, 
And when your experience is heartfelt and sincere, you nurture hope. Hence the story of Bob the Gardener and lessons number one and two on the proverbial kindergarten wall, share everything and play fair. Nearly two decades later, a Bob is still working for uh, IU. Uh, when I sent a note to Sarah Ellen Mamlin, who is in Kenya currently, and asked her to email me a picture of Bob, she sent it to me along with a short message stating that, well, Bob's still trying, but he has never really picked up the, picked up the art of gardening. <laughs> and in my reply to Sarah Ellen, I said, well, that's all the more reason we love him. So reflecting on other personal experiences, I will try to illustrate a few of the important lessons I have learned. Meaning is found in discovering who we are, acknowledging and managing our gifts and our imperfections, listening, truly listening, taking risks, and in giving and receiving simple human kindnesses. Now inscribed in the temple of Apollo at Delphi is this ancient saying, know thyself. Leaving aside, at least for the time being, the transcendent or theological implications of that aphorism, making a difference in our world starts with knowing and accepting ourselves in terms of our own personalities, our ha habits, our behaviors, and of course, our weaknesses. Well, I grew up in a big family, as uh, Craig, I think, maybe alluded to, four brothers and eight sisters. I was the third oldest. One summer evening, uh, my folks are in the audience here, they have not heard this speech. Um, one summer evening, I had accompanied my parents and one of my sisters to a Starlight Musical production of a Broadway show. Perhaps you remember Starlight Musicals, the old Starlight Musicals, where there was a roof over the stage, but from your seat in the auditorium, you could look at the stars on the stage or the stars overhead. Now, upon returning home from that show, one of my other sisters was standing on the very top doorstep of our front door, sobbing, sobbing uncontrollably about one of my younger brothers. The police, she kept saying, the police, they came and they took him away. Now, four, dec four decades later, my entire family, uh, and even my brother, can chuckle about that day. It's not that brother, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> At the time, it was a crisis. It seems my brother and one of his friends had decided that a solution to a, a boring Indianapolis summer evening was uh, to chop down a couple of our neighbor's trees and to slash their car tires. <laughs> and of course, my brother got caught. Now, I'm sure he had some imperfections and some of those even of his own doing, but this episode caused me a lot of guilt. After all, as one often sees in adolescent sibling rivalries, my goal in life then was to stay a step ahead of my brother. Get better grades, run faster, be stronger, basically to beat him up and keep him down at least whenever my parents weren't looking. <laughs> but on that starry night, I realized what an awful selfish brother I had been. It was as if someone had held up a mirror to my soul and for the first time I saw what a curmudgeon I really was. Now today I have a bit better understanding of that particular episode, but on that day, I resolved that I would do better toward my brother. And uh, as a father of six children now, uh, three boys and three girls, I've tried to encourage them not to repeat my mistake. Every night when I uh, used to tuck them into bed, there's only one I still tuck into bed, but uh, every night when I tuck them into bed, uh, I would say, what is your number one job? And they would reply, to take good care of my brothers and sisters. Now, uh, my other imperfections, I'm not sure we want to go there. Uh, my uh, prom date uh, in junior, <laughs> my, my, my prom date would have told you I have lousy taste in clothes. And <laughs> as a young man, I learned very quickly that I would not be winning beauty contests uh, unless, of course, my mother was judging. <laughs> Most of us readily discover that we are imperfect. Reconciling that, accepting it is the challenge. Nevertheless, it is our imperfections, our Achilles heel, if you will, that define us as who we are, at least in part. Now, I'm sometimes asked, what is the most difficult challenge you face in Kenya? And my answer is invariably the same. Americans getting along with Americans. Uh, here we might do well to recall 
uh, the lessons on that kindergarten wall. But of all the things I learned, my favorite of them all was a little poem hanging on the kindergarten wall. Oh, the wall. You learn, you remember this the best. Don't hurt each other and clean up your mess. Take a nap every day. Wash before you eat. Hold hands, stick together look before you cross the street. Okay. Now, as many of you know, in any given month, up to 60 different individuals uh, will be housed in that fishbowl we call the IU House. That's a lot of people and a lot of potential for relationships to go awry. To illustrate my point, I was tempted to give a true example of Americans not getting along with Americans in Kenya, and immediately about 15 examples came to mind. But then I began to think, well, what if word got back that I talked about them, or even worse, what if they were in this audience today listening to me, <laughs> and I described them as jealous, spiteful, egotistical, or just plain lazy? Uh, no, that wouldn't work. So instead, let me turn to Shakespeare. The life lesson eloquently expressed in Hamlet by Polonius to his son Laertes, uh, I think is well known to most of you. The wind sits in the shoulder of your tail. Those friends thou hast in their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Teach each, take each man's censure, uh, but reserve thy judgment. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not be false to any man. Well, let's shift gears. The next lesson is perhaps less a lesson than a personal discovery, it, namely flight kying, <laughs> flying kites. Flying kites is a metaphor uh, for life. As a child, I really did used to love flying kites, and the first movie I saw was Mary Poppins. Um, it's an uh, upbeat tune, Let's Go Fly a Kite, is one that I still love to whistle today, and it can make a four-year-old uh, and her 53-year-old father feel invincible. Where the air is clear, oh, let's go fly a kite. When you send it flying up there, all at once you're lighter than air. You can dance on the breeze over houses and trees with your pistol and tight to the string of your kite. So dancing on breezes over houses and trees, I mean, you really begin to feel that you can make the impossible possible. But first, you've got to understand how to hold on to that spool of string, and that's where things uh, began to get tricky for Abigail and me a couple of weeks ago. The wind was cantankerous, unpredictable, and uncooperative. Uh, during those few minutes when it really was gentle and supportive, buffeting her kite, her passions soared. But when the wind drove the kite to the earth, her spirit sank. She had neither the skill nor the experience to let the string out. Limited to a short string, limited to a short string, her kite was not able to endure the vicissitudes of the wind. But with a little encouragement from me, she tried again. This time I put my hand over her hand on the spool and showed her how to let it out. And little by little, the kite caught the breeze and before long, it was a couple of hundred feet in the air. Even then, when a gust of wind drove the cut kite precipitously toward the, the ground, Abigail uh, and uh, the kite seemed to sense what needed to be done. The kite righted itself and it flew on up to the heavens. Now, needing a helper, a friend, or a mentor as we journey through life seems self-evident. It's astonishing to me how often we forget that truth. Just to give this 30-minute lecture, I received help from uh, several persons. When I look back over the last 30 years, the number of helpers, friends, and mentors are far too many to name. One never accomplishes anything by oneself. No matter what you do, what goal you strive for, or what accolades you receive, the plain truth is that your achievement, like my achievement, is a reflection of the cumulative effort and input of tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of persons. I think it's arrogant to claim otherwise. Sometimes, perhaps, I think it's best that we purge the word I from our vocabulary, at least whenever we can, uh, and substitute the word we. But 
to substitute or use the word we means that we need to be pretty adept at developing personal or professional relationships with other individuals. And that's tricky business. It's not necessarily intuitive and it requires trust. Shortly after we moved into the IU house, uh, Leanne and I had an evening dinner party for a number of guests. By that time, we had already hired a cook for IU House. Uh, her name was Penina. This is Penina here in the middle. Of course, the photo's uh, 20 years later. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, she's got two daughters who weren't born at the time, uh, Naomi on the one side and Leah on the other. At any rate, um, at that time, we didn't really have many guests at IU House, and so Penina only cooked lunch for us. And in the late afternoon, I would always drive her home in the daylight. But for this particular evening, uh, we had asked her to stay over to help with the dishes uh, and to do some cooking. It was dark when the time came to drive her home. Now, there were no street lights in Eldoret then, at least not in our part of the, our neck of the woods. And it, at the time uh, it came for me to drive her home, it was beginning to rain. I was tired and, to be honest, a little bit cranky. At the time, uh, the IU vehicle consisted of an old Datsun 210, a rear wheel, rear wheel drive uh, um, uh, two-door two, two vehicle. Um, as uh, Panina and I got into the car, Bob, the gardener, tapped on the window and said he'd like to come with us. His request irritated me. Now, why does he want to bum a ride up to Longus, where Panina lived? Why does he want to bum a ride up to Longus at this hour of the night? I thought to myself, well, at the time, I really still hardly knew Bob. I knew that he carried this big ponga, big machete, uh, to cut the grass with. And to be perfectly honest, his two wives were always quarreling, and they annoyed me. <laughs> but other than that, I really didn't know anything about him. So with a curt, OK, get in the back, uh, we took off. Now, Longus was a few miles away. We arrived at the spot where I customarily dropped Panina. Uh, her house about a football field away from the, the road, and I waited for her to get out. But she simply sat there motionless uh, and said, well, I'm not getting out here. At this time of night, it's not safe. You've got to drive me to my door. Um, so um, I looked at her, looked out across this now muddy, slick field, and I thought to myself, gee whiz, I don't know that this car can make it across that field. Nevertheless, stepped on the accelerator, gunned the engine, slid, slipped, fishtailed my way across the field, dropped her literally at her doorstep, turned the, door, turned the car around, and slipped and slid and fishtailed back to the tarmac and on back to um, IU House. And the whole time, Bob, sitting in the back, said nothing. We got to IU House. Um, he opened the door, got out, thank you so much, and went into his house. At which point, it was very clear to me that I was a fool. Uh, not only had I misjudged the danger of traveling outside at night in that part of town, I had wrongly judged Bob to the point of mistrusting him. Fortunately, Bob was not as judgmental. He understood that I was making assumptions that were just plain wrong. But rather than confronting me about them, he went along for the ride to protect me. I learned or relearned several lessons uh, that evening. I need to be more ready uh, to question my own assumptions before acting. Trust is the cornerstone of lasting relationships, and trust in relationships, personal or professional, take time uh, to develop and mature. Fran Quigley's book about AMPATH and the IU-Kenya partnership should be in print within a month. Uh, the title emphasizes the importance of relationships walking together, walking far. Borrows from an African proverb which says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk with a friend. I can assure you without the current, I can assure you without the hundreds and thousands of Americans and Kenyans who have walked with us, the current leaders of the IU-Kenya partnership, especially me, would not amount to a hill of beans. Well, welcome to my office. Um, if, you, if you can see, I've got photos of my kids on my desk. Um, and just above them, pinned to the bulletin board, is a quote from Carl Rogers. It says, we think we listen, but very rarely do we listen with real understanding, true empathy. 
Yet listening of this very special kind is one of the most potent forces for change that I know. I'd like to tell you the story of one of my patients at Westside Health Center. Let's call him Larry. I remember uh, one particular day he dressed in baggy, tattered shirt, oversized pants. He just looked at me with these vacant eyes. Around his shoulders, he carried an old Indianapolis grimy star uh, newspaper bag. I had seen him carry it into the office many, many times previously, and I always wondered if perhaps in one uh, time in his life he had been a paper boy. He never bathed, and the odor that seeped from his clothing reminded me of a wrestling room. In his 40s now, he had the mental capacity of a first grader. I don't feel good, he said. I had been hurrying to finish my last few patients so I could go home, relax, and enjoy a peaceful evening after an especially hectic day. I had examined Larry many times in the past, but there was something in Larry's voice this day that called me to slow down and listen. In a monotone, gravelly voice, his fears spilled out. He told me about his mother, her death from cancer a year previously, his life without her, and his terrible loneliness. I didn't say a thing, but after he finished telling his story, Larry smiled and his eyes brightened. He stood up to leave, extended his hand, and said, thanks, Doc. The sacred trust that physicians hold with their patients can be a window into the soul. It allows us to share in great joy, but also to witness great suffering, including some of the darkest, most crippling acts that one human being can commit against another human being. Most of us, myself included, do not fully understand the magnitude of these personal tragedies, the suffering, the shame. But I'm convinced that by listening, truly listening to those who suffer, each of us, whether physician or not, can help them find their way back to wholeness. It's not an easy task. We think we listen, but very rarely do we listen with real understanding true empathy. Yet listening of this very special kind is one of the most potent forces for change that I know. Let's return to flying kites, youthful passion and idealism. As an adolescent and a young man, I believed every individual had the potential to change our world. And now as a middle-aged, nearly uh, over-the-hill faculty member at a staid Midwestern medical school, I still believe that. Never underestimate your potential to make your home or your community or your world a better place. I chose a career in medicine because I thought that field best suited me as a means to accomplishing that end, and I have never regretted that choice. When I meet with, new, with uh, my new group of medical students on the wards of Wishart Hospital, and we get a new group every couple of months, it's customary to share expectations. I listen to their expectations, and they listen to mine. I try to remind my students that every patient they see is somebody's son or somebody's daughter. No question about it, every patient you're going to see is somebody's son, somebody's daughter, and likely someone's mother, father, grandmother, and grandfather. I'll tell my students, regardless of the color of the patient's skin, the size of their pocketbooks, the language they speak, the type of clothes they wear, or how they smell, I expect you to treat them as if you would a mother or a father, whether you are in their presence or in the classroom or in the call room just talking about them. I believe there is a moral imperative to help our neighbors, and a corollary to that is the right to essential health care for all persons. Examine any, of the ten, any, of the, any faith, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, or secular, the tenets of secular humanism. The moral imperative to assist a neighbor in need is absolute. The fundamental question that each of us has to ask ourselves is this. Am I going to act on that moral imperative, or am I going to close my eyes to it? It's a choice we must make. I think you would agree that risk is inherent in every choice, and that risk, and that risk has the potential to cause a lot of angst in each of us. In the mid-1980s, before some of us could ever pick out Kenya on a map of Africa, took a leave of absence from Indiana University to work as a volunteer physician for a year in a remote area of Haiti. It was at the time my first extended visit to a so-called developing country and the culmination of a desire that I had had since high school. At the time, I believed, and I of course still believe, that each of us has the duty to defend and restore human dignity. 
As a physician, I believed I would understand better how to do that by having worked with people who live with the horror of no choice or at best severely constrained choice. At the time, uh, Leanne and I had just two kids, uh, Rob and Zach, uh, both in diapers. Now our site in electricity had no, in Haiti, had no electricity, no running water, uh, and of course no phone. Zach, uh, the youngest, was just eight months old. Uh, he had been born premature, uh, having spent the first week of his life uh, on a ventilator. I remember Leanne and I used to remark at how floppy this kid was. Though I was excited uh, to, uh, to work in Haiti and to immerse myself in the culture there, the risk was anxiety provoking. Uh, I traveled to Haiti a week ahead of my family and the first night I slept in a hotel room with that bearded man in the slide there, uh, Tom O'Toole. He was a sociologist from Minnesota, familiar with Haiti, and he was going to take me the next day up to the site where I had been posted. Well, the hotel room there in Port-au-Prince where Tom and I um, uh, were sleeping that night uh, was a small room. It had two single beds, one alongside the other. And at some point in the middle of the night, I began to sleepwalk. And I stood up on the, mattress of, <laughs> on the mattress at the foot of my bed, and like a lion leaping at the hindquarters of a zebra, I jumped onto Tom's bed. <laughs> His bedpost shattered. The mattress boards fell out, and Tom and I both crashed to the floor. Now, for sure, Haiti was a very challenging experience. <laughs> no, I was actually trying to be serious here. <laughs> For sure, Haiti was a challenging experience, <laughs> though, though enlightening. At times, it was physically and emotionally draining, testing our marriage and threatening to our young family. At other times, the experience was uplifting and affirming. Professionally, the experience provided me knowledge, skills, and especially insight. Insight into public and community health, gender inequality, nutrition, starvation, institutional relationships, and health systems. All of this laid the groundwork for the work that would happen in Kenya over the subsequent two decades. So the lesson here, and this one's really not written on the kindergarten wall, uh, there comes a time when you simply have to make a leap of faith. Taking, taking risks gives texture and meaning to our lives. Six feet under in a cemetery is the only environment I'm aware of that is risk-free. For sure, taking risks causes anxiety, and none of us are immune from it, but through dedicated preparation and with the support of trusting relationships, we can move forward with confidence. In going to Haiti, I was quite literally at a new boundary line, looking at a new frontier. To guide me, I had the hard-earned knowledge and skills that come from years of dedicated preparation, and I was grounded in my own culture and my own traditions. But each new experience, each unpredictable event, uh, challenged my knowledge, challenged my skills and my beliefs, and that was good. After all, at times, uh, perceptions really can be uh, deceiving. It reminded me, I'm reminded of, a time when I was a few years later in Masai Mara with my brother and my sister-in-law on a safari. Uh, and my sister was taking, had a video camera, sister-in-law taking a, a video camera and taking pictures of the landscape. And my brother and I suddenly saw an elephant several hundred feet away. Look, we exclaimed, there's an elephant. My sister-in-law, all the time looking through her video camera uh, as she scanned the landscape, kept saying, where's the elephant? Where's the elephant? When we returned home and we watched the video clip that she had been taking, sure enough, uh, the elephant uh, was there, looming as big, as big as an elephant on the screen. Yet on the audio portion of the video, you could hear her voice clear as mine saying, where's an elephant? No, that's not an elephant, it's a tree. <laughs> It's a true story. <laughs> but we really don't have to go to another country to face a new frontier, do we? After all, isn't life just a series of choices, a series of decisions, each with their own consequences, which in turn simply raise new challenges that demand new choices? We can retreat from each new boundary and cling blindly to our beliefs, or like impulsive wildebeest crossing the Mara River, we can plunge ahead without preparation and without thinking. Or we can consider who we are allow ourselves to question our own assumptions, and then, after due consideration, make just the right choice until, of course, we reach the next new frontier. But before I 
try to wax too philosophical, let me go back to even before Haiti, in this case Nigeria. Now, some of you are probably thinking that the person who was really making that leap to Nigeria and then to Haiti was not me, but my poor wife. Uh, and you might be thinking that I was dragging her to hell and not necessarily to hell and back. <laughs> so uh, my response to you is, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, which brings me to arguably the most important lesson from my Indy, Nigeria, Haiti, Kenya, Indy experience, uh, which is when you settle down for the long haul, choosing a partner is the most important decision you'll ever make. Make sure you choose the right one. Now, how we respond to any challenge, including choosing a partner, uh, depends to a certain extent on our values. To one degree or, or another, each one of us has accepted and lives by a particular value system, but why? What values did you choose and why did you choose them? Are they the right values? Of course, answering these questions requires that we dig even deeper at times. At some level, of these questions become questions of faith. I think it's important for each of us and our institutions to re-examine periodically our core values. The process can be revealing, affirming, and refreshing. I'd like to focus a few of the minutes uh, that are left in this uh, presentation on Joe Mamlin and one of the many lessons that he has taught me. None of us would be here today hearing about the IU-Kenya partnership if not for Joe's leadership. If Joe had been willing to take a few days off from his work in Kenya, uh, today he would be giving this lecture and I would be in the audience enjoying every minute of it. Now, Joe and I are both early risers. Uh, when I go to Kenya, which I do three or four times each year, Joe and I tend to meet early in the morning before the sun is up and before almost any other person at IU House has awakened. When Joe and I speak publicly about AMPATH and the IU Kenya program, we tend to give a sanitized version of it. Uh, but behind closed doors, we grapple with the ugly underbelly, uh, wrestling with challenges that might frighten away some of our most ardent supporters, uh, two of whom are sitting in the front row here. <laughs> now, during one of my uh, visits a few months ago, um, I was having one of those days uh, that Craig was talking about uh, before. Uh, on the wards, in the classrooms, in the halls of government, um, in the communities and among the Americans in IU House, the forces of greed and self-interest were rattling their sabers. The environment was increasingly hostile and discouraging to the point that I lapsed into saying to myself, why am I here? What am I really accomplishing? Early the next morning, as he does every morning, Joe had gotten up to prepare dog food and feed the three wayward dogs that now make their home at IU House. Now, unless you're a pathologic dog lover, you would probably agree with me that these dogs are not particularly desirable. They're mutts. They scare virtually every Kenyan who comes to visit. They bark all night and keep weary jet lag visitors from sleeping, and they're always licking themselves. Okay, truth be told, I don't like dogs even here in the United States, and importantly, Joe knows that. So, so when I said to Joe, Joe, you have so much on your plate and so many other things you should be doing, why do you make the effort to feed these scoundrel dogs? Joe looked at me and without missing a beat replied, sometimes it's the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> now, perhaps you need to... <laughs> Perhaps you need to know Mamlin a little while, but his response wasn't really about feeding dogs. The it he was referring to is unconditional love. To repeat, sometimes unconditional love is the only thing that makes sense. All of us need heroes. All of us need heroes. And for most of us, the heroes in our lives are those persons who quietly walk the high road, do their job without fanfare, demonstrate integrity in their convictions and express small kindnesses with humility. They don't look for credit. Indeed, they are rarely recognized with it, but they are the people who give us hope. They rock babies at Riley, fold linens in nursing homes, teach our kids to dance, work in factories, and do any number of other routine jobs with the resolve that they are making a better life for their children, our children, and our country. We should never underestimate the power of these quiet examples. 
as we celebrate IUPUI's 40th anniversary, I would like to tell you briefly about one of my other heroes, one of our own. She is the middle-aged woman pictured on this slide. Her name is Ellen. 32 years ago, if you had been an undergraduate student here at IUPUI sitting in Kavanaugh Hall, she would have been one of your classmates. Now, as a young woman, she was an exceptional violinist, an avid runner, a pretty good volleyball player, and a gifted writer. She still is a gifted writer. She gradu graduated from college at 19 with a humanities degree, joined the Peace Corps, and spent two years in the desert of Niger. And uh, Niger is just a truly God-forsaken part of this world. She returned to America, having decided to become a medical doctor. She enrolled here at IUPUI, completed a second degree, this time in chemistry. And then she enrolled at McGill University School of Medicine in Canada. Since completing medical school in Canada, uh, she has lived her entire professional life in the remotest parts of Nigeria and far northern Cameroon, serving the people there wholly as a volunteer. She likes to describe me as the one she carried on her back, a phrase commonly used by girls in many parts of West Africa to describe a sibling that comes after them in birth order. Ellen chose not to get married nor have children. I had the privilege of visiting her in Cameroon several years ago where she runs a government district hospital and community outreach program. At that time, she was the only medical doctor in the district serving tens of thousands of people. Sitting in the wards of her hospital, surrounded by some of the most destitute, wretched persons on this earth, I asked her if she ever regretted not having a family. She smiled and replied, I could not be happier. Then, gesturing to the staff and all the patients that filled every bed in the ward, she said, this is my family. These are my brothers and sisters. In closing, on behalf of Dr. Bantz and the entire IUPUI family, I'd like to thank you for listening to this lecture. As you leave this campus, and particularly for those of you who will be graduating soon and continuing your own journeys, we hope you will keep us in your thoughts and prayers. As for me, I will return home this evening. I'll wrap my arms around each of my girls and then tuck my littlest one, my kindergartner-to-be, uh, into bed. And as I do that, I will say to her, Abby, what is your number one job? And she will reply to me, as she always does, to take good care of my brothers and sisters. Thank you.